I could listen to the latest pop music hits for hours on end, and I'm still not likely to remember the lyrics. But if you ask me to listen to songs from the 1980s, chances are much better that I'll know every word. There's a term in psychology called the reminiscence bump. It's the theory that the music you listened to when you were in your teens and 20s is etched in your memory and stays with you your whole life. During late adolescence and early adulthood, our brain's memory systems are at their most efficient. How's that for sobering news? That means that remembering lyrics were easier then than they are now. But more importantly, it is during that formative period of our lives when our identity and personhood was most taking shape. So the music we were listening to back then became forever linked to critical and memorable events, the significant choices we were making, the long-term relationships we were forming, the first glimpses of independence we were experiencing, and the cultural and political and religious beliefs that we were choosing to view the world. So the reminiscence bump phenomenon suggests that when you listen to that music now, you can not only remember the lyrics, you can remember who you were and who you are. It's certainly true for me. Play Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, and I can picture myself hanging out with my college buddies in our dorm. Have me listen to the theme song from The Greatest American Hero, and I can sing every word, and I can picture my third grade friend David as we made replica Greatest American Hero action figures out of pipe cleaners and construction paper. Play Starlight Vocal Band's Afternoon Delight, and I can picture myself at five years old listening to it in my parents' car as we were driving around. I hummed that song often until I later realized what the song was about. And don't get me started on Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. I feel like my college years were filled with one Rick roll after another. It is the songs of our youth that stick with us longer than any other. The book of Colossians is written to Christians in adolescence. It's interesting that as Paul was writing to them, he was writing to a place he had never visited and to a people he had never met. It was a fellow missionary named Epaphras who started that church, and all Paul knew about the Colossians was secondhand. But he did know this. He knew that the Christians in Colossae were in the adolescent stage of their faith. They were new Christians beginning to face the pressures of the culture around them and the, and the temptations to steer away from true and full commitment to Jesus. So if you read the book of Colossians, which wouldn't take long, I mean, it's only four chapters long, it reads like a parent giving their adolescent child some advice on how to experience the world for themselves. So it should be no surprise that right here in today's scripture reading, in the first chapter of Colossians, Paul teaches them a song, a song that he hopes would stick with them through the adolescence of their faith and, and later provide a kind of reminiscence bump for the rest of their lives. He quotes the lyrics for what was apparently one of the earliest Christian hymns that was sung about Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know how the melody went or how catchy the hook was, but we do know the lyrics. The first line goes like this. The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And the rest of the song is a majestic, sweeping depiction of Jesus Christ, high and exalted over the whole universe. All things visible and invisible were made by him, it says. He is more powerful than any ruler or kingdom. He is the head of the church, the firstborn of the dead. He is, as we celebrate on this holy day, Christ the King. It's quite a song. It's quite a song to teach people in the adolescence of their spiritual lives. Because if they could remember this song 
and remember the meaning of this song, then no matter what changes and challenges occur over the decades to come, this song could always bring them back to a sense of assurance and certainty about God. And may that be the same for you and me. Today's scripture reading might serve as a reminiscence bump to remind you of the early formative moments of your own faith, of your earliest inklings of who Jesus Christ was to you, and remind you of the times when you first began to sense the presence of God at work in your life. So reminisce with me. If you were raised in the Christian faith, you may have tender memories of hearing your parents read you Bible stories or, or your grandparents praying out loud. How about a Sunday school teacher who taught you using a flannel board or, or led you in songs like Jesus Loves the Little Children? You might recall the summer camp where you lifted a hand to accept Jesus Christ into your heart or the church building where you knelt for your confirmation or the moments you held in your hands the first Bible you ever owned. Some of your memories may be deeply internal as well. Like that time you felt alone and reached out to God for the first time for a sense of companionship and hope. Or when you felt afraid and sensed the comfort of God in your heart for the first time. Or, or when you felt the wonder and awe of God in nature and realized that there is something out there that is so much bigger than you imagined. Paul is giving you a reminiscence bump today to remind you that this Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, Christ the King, has been there with you from the very beginning during the earliest and most tender years of your faith, even before you realized it. Provenient grace, as Methodists call it. But we can't help but also realize how much has changed in our lives since those early years, right? I mean, as time has gone by, your, your younger days of innocence and wonder have been etched with trauma and hardship that you could not have expected. You may have wandered off for a bit in a world of competing ideas and belief systems, even going through patches of doubt or skepticism or disbelief. You may even be going through that right now. There may have been times when you have experienced harm from other churches in your past, and you are more wary about the faith than you were before. Well, Paul would say to each of us today, welcome home, welcome back. And he would invite us to listen to this song of Christ the King and remember that even since the earliest, most tender days of our faith journey, you have never been alone. God has been with us and God is with us still. Well, I know it's harder for most of us to remember song lyrics nowadays, but if I were to pick one line from this whole hymn in Colossians 1 to ask you to commit to memory, it would be the one in verse 17. All things are held together in him. It's no coincidence that this line is in the very center of the entire hymn because it suggests that Jesus Christ can be the center that can hold everything in your life together. All things are held together in him. Jesus is the only center that can hold. I've used a metaphor before about the giant ships in the port of Tampa. Now, these massive ships, as you know, are driven by huge turbines that spin blades at incredibly high speeds and, and push out water to make the boats go. You can envision in your mind what these turbines look like. Large fan blades that are connected to a central shaft which is connected to the engines. The blades rotate, the shaft rotates, the boat goes. Now, here's what's interesting. Theoretically speaking, there is a line that runs down the center line of that shaft from tip to tip that stays perfectly fixed, immobile, despite however fast those blades are rotating. So think about it, even though those blades are rotating at amazingly high speeds, that center line of that shaft stays fixed. And if there was any vibration, any motion whatsoever in the center line of that shaft, the shaft would break, the blades would fly apart, and the boat wouldn't move. 
Because you see, what matters most is what's in the center. Friends, your life has a lot of rotating fan blades. Each of us has chaos swirling in our lives. There's not a single exception among us. One personal crisis after another, uncertain futures, unsteady times. And we will try anything to hold it all together, looking for a center that is steady. We look for ways to distract us and divert us from all the chaos, but that center will not hold. Some of us will try to find significance and meaning through our careers, our accomplishments, or even our children. Some of us will even pursue strategies that wind up causing even more chaos and harm. So Paul is very clear in this hymn. Jesus is the only center of your life that will hold. He's been with you since your earliest days and through the adolescence of your faith. He's more powerful than any ruler or kingdom in the world, and he wants to be your Lord. He's the center that remains fixed through any hardship and will hold amid any chaos. And all that's required is for you to put Jesus in the center of your life. A full commitment is what I'm thinking of. You wouldn't get this from any other guy. Paul just wants to tell you how he's feeling. Paul just wants to make you understand that Jesus is never going to give you up. He's never going to let you down. Never going to run around and desert you. Never going to make you cry. Never going to say goodbye. Never going to tell a lie and hurt you. Let's pray. God, thank you for Jesus Christ, who has revealed to us all we need to know about you and your relationship with us. Thank you for your love that saves us from our sins, for your presence that accompanies us when we feel alone, for the courage to do what is right when it is easier to do harm, for your grace that follows us even when we wander away, and for your hope, which is always there to welcome us home. In the name of Christ the King, Amen.